Drage gledateljice i gledatelji, dobrodošli u Atma podcast. Velika čast mi je najaviti mog današnjeg gosta. On je dr. Kenneth Walpey, doktor profesor Vajšnavske teologije s Oksforda, znanstveni istraživač vedskih tekstova i prevoditelj sa sanskrita, autor preko 20 knjiga i predavač. Ono što ga čini posebnim je činjenica da dr. Walpey nije samo akademik i ekspert za vede, već i praktičar vedske škole Bhakti Yoga još od 1972. godine. 2014. je prihvatio zavjet Sanjasa, što znači odvojenik, sa zaređenim imenom Krišna Kšetra Svami, te osim u akademskom, također i u svojstvu duhovnog učitelja, putuje diljem svijeta podučavajući i vodeći mnoge tragatelje na putu bhakti joge ili duhovnog procesa predanog služenja Bogu. Pa krenimo! Dr. Walpe, welcome to Atma Podcast. Welcome to Split. It is my great honor to talk to you today. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's my good privilege to be to be with you and to be in Split. Yes, do you I, like Split? I have Split to Split, as <laughs> they say in America. <laughs> so, yes. um, you dedicated most of your life into the research of uh, ancient Vedic scriptures, literature, Sanskrit, So we all know that there are many theories about the very origin of Vedas and the very age of Vedas. So what's your personal view on this, the age and the origin, but also for which purposes were they composed? Ah, these are many big questions. Yeah. <laughs> and what keeps uh, scholars in business is disagreeing with each other about these things. And of course, um, they're happy to promote their theories. And I have to say that I personally am not so much involved in that particular area of scholarship where I'm trying to determine uh, the age of, of Vedic literature. Perhaps I should say f- first that Veda is a very broad term which can be more narrowly taken or more broadly. Uh, there's what are called uh, the Veda, uh, Vedic Samhitas, uh, most famously the Rig Veda Samhita, uh, which is uh, more than 1,000 hymns in a language which some will call Sanskrit, but technically uh, could just be called Ve- Vedic. Mm-hmm. And uh, the common scholarly consensus for the age of Rig Veda goes to, from, usually it goes from 1200 BC to 1500 BC. That's from uh, scholarly perspectives of uh, persons who generally are ready to admit that we're just guessing. <laughs> <laughs> And it's because uh, these texts were not concerned about Uh, this sense of time that we have today. In fact, we could say that's one of the distinctive features of Veda in the narrower and the broader sense, that the interest was in timelessness. Mm. It was about going beyond time. So if we think about purpose of Veda, I find it uh, really in the broadest and deepest sense it's it's about how can we as human beings go beyond time <laughs> mm-hmm. to realize um, our own um, reality our own existence which is beyond time which is confined to time as we experience it normally but which can be experienced in a different way mm-hmm. but um Uh, when we speak also about the origins, uh, who wrote them? Okay, if you uh, speak to the traditional um, Vedic uh, Brahmins, um, they will say, that's the wrong question to ask. Mm. With all due respect. <laughs> <laughs> they, will, they will say, 
Uh, they were not written by any persons. They are called apurusheya. That's the Sanskrit term, uh, which means, purusha means a person, and uh, when you add the prefix a ah before it, it negates. So they say they were <coughs> not, comp they weren't exactly composed, they were seen, uh, they were envisioned by sages, and these sages are named uh, in uh, each of the hymns of the Rig Veda, especially uh, there will be a different sage who is identified. But it's understood by the tradition that it's not that they composed, but rather they saw and then they evoked what was already there. It's kind of revelation, like um, exactly. from the God. Yeah, it's a revelation, and uh, so they will say there is no beginning to Veda. It's mm -hmm. always there. Even after this whole cosmos, the whole universe, uh, even after its total destruction, however many eons from now, um, Veda will still be there. Mm -hmm. There will be an, another creation, and then Vedas will be recalled as they were before. So there's, that indicates also the sense of timelessness that the Veda is concerned with. Um, and so, yeah, this question of who wrote them, well, okay, now take the more um, modern perspective and it will simply be said, okay, those who are identified in each hymn uh, would be the ones who have composed the particular hymns. There's also the, the tradition of organizing the Veda that a certain uh, figure, a certain personage or personality, we sometimes say, uh, Vyasa, um, organized, he is said to have divided, and therefore that name is given that uh, he is Vyasa, he is um, separating out. And then he was giving portions of Veda to different students mm -hmm. that he had, and then they were learning those portions, giving that on to their students. And in this way, it's uh, been carried down over time. An interesting thing about uh, these uh, very early texts, the, I speak again of the Rig Veda, is um, the tradition of the recitation of these texts has been maintained over the millennia by a particular process of learning, uh, of hearing and repetition, where there's guarantees that every single syllable will be there and will be pronounced in the right way and will not be lost. And that's been carried over, over millennia, and there are um, schools in India, especially South India, uh, where they start with kids that are f five years old. Good memory. <laughs> and these kids, uh, you know, they just hear and repeat, hear yeah. and repeat, and until it's, until it's part of their body, they embody the Veda, essentially. Yeah. I watched it on YouTube. I also saw it on India. It's amazing and has such a mystical feeling to it when yeah, you, there's when you a hear lot of it. Power there. Yeah, yeah, we are drawn to it. Like, yeah. wow, it's amazing. <laughs> yes. So, would you say that maybe uh, Vedas and Sanskrit are the like oldest knowledge and the oldest language on the earth? Um, maybe. <laughs> maybe. What do you think? <laughs> I, I'm hesitant to say because uh, I haven't lived back at the time of, say, the Rig Veda. <laughs> Maybe so in another know. body. <laughs> yes, and um, of course, um, the traditional um, Vedic scholars of India today, they will be very assertive to say, yes, this is the oldest. Um, so maybe it is. In any case, it's, it's very old. The question I think has to come up, is older, therefore, more authoritative or better in yes, some way? Yes, that's a better question. I think we have to ask that. Um, 
And it could be the case that it is. Uh, it could be that texts from earlier times uh, have, um, have, have a wisdom which we have lost um, as time has passed on, as technology has, um, has engulfed us, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't want to say, yes, the Vedas yeah, are the I... oldest. Now, from, a, from another perspective, I personally like to say that Veda, in the most broad and comprehensive sense, where you take the word Veda, which in Sanskrit comes from vid, which means to know, um, is it's about all human knowledge or all human wisdom um, from what in later times may be branched out into different traditions, including traditions of the West, including our religious, spiritual traditions of the West, uh, in which uh, there is deep wisdom. So I like to think, yes, that's also Veda in the broader sense of what is yeah. Veda, rather than thinking in um, sectarian uh, ways, which I don't think is always so helpful. I agree, yeah. So m often people are also confused about uh, terms like Hinduism, Vedas, Dharma, which is what? What is actually Hinduism? I know it's kind of <laughs> umbrella word, you know, for yeah. many things. So can you put a little cl clarity on this? Uh, the word Hindu is one that we don't find in the Vedas <laughs> until uh, much more recently, from like 16th century, we start seeing the word Hindu. And it seems to be an import uh, from outside of what we now call India, there is a river uh, between what we now call India and uh, what is now Pakistan, or within Pakistan, uh, the river Sindh, and, or Sindhu. And uh, the story we understand is that those who are on the western side of that river referred to those on the e eastern side as hin Hindu. They didn't speak out the S that became Hindu. Mm -hmm. And so it was a geographical uh, term, which not until the 19th century with the British presence and their concern, uh, their political concerns, which had a lot to do with meddling in the cultures and religions of India, um, uh, it became Hinduism. There was no such thing as Hinduism. Mm -hmm. uh, and now somehow that caught on. And now people in India are, are thinking, I am Hindu. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, many of them then identify that with the land which has come to be called India. Um, so it gets complicated. Yeah. What, what, is it, what does it mean? What's its value? Um, I had one professor who, uh, when I was uh, studying Hinduism, he said, you know, Hinduism uh, really about anything that you say about it, the opposite is bound to be also true. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> There's so much that, it's such a broad, yeah, yeah. that goes under. Now, one thing that's generally said about Hinduism to try to, you know, put it all in one bag, but which is actually also not true, but uh, is generally to it, true is that Hindus take the Veda, Rig Veda, Sama, Yajur, Tarva, the Upanishads, and other Vedic literature, as revelation and as authoritative. Generally, one can't say absolutely. Um, and they may say, yes, Veda, we follow Veda. And then you ask a Hindu, an average Hindu, so can you tell me something it says in Veda? Mm, well, not really. 
because um, it's it's not something that's part of their lives ex uh, directly. Um, but in general, we can make that connection. Yes, Veda, there is a sense that this is our revelate, revelatory scriptures, and um, from them we have the understanding of ultimate purpose of life and so on. Uh, you mentioned dharma, that's another difficult word. <laughs> uh, we can go on and on. If you look in a, a Sanskrit dictionary under dharma, uh, you'll see many different ways that it's translated. Uh, one way to... S I, what I like, the way I like to uh, think of dharma most is at, just with the English word ethics. Dharma is ethics, uh, because ethics is, it's about nor normativity. It's about what should I do, what ought I to do. It's about here's what is, and here's what ought to be, and how do I get from what's here to, uh, from is to, to what ought to be. Uh, that bridge, you can say. Uh, is is the idea of dharma. Mm -hmm. But in India, they have uh, conferences. You'll find scholars coming together regularly uh, discussing what is dharma because it's kind of an open-ended term. Uh, one of the most famous works of the broadly speaking Vedic uh, corpus is the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and uh, this Bhagavad Gita is sometimes considered a kind of uh, core text to also understand what is Dharma. Uh, but maybe we can elaborate on that a little later if you want. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Also, I wanted to ask you this question because when we um, talk about the origin of Vedas, there always pops up this Aryan invasion theory. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit uh, what is it and has it been disputed? Is it still strongly like accepted in academia? Uh, because I hear that some, it's just another theory. Mm. Right? But they taught uh, the students in the books about it. Ah, yes. Um, the Aryan invasion theory was uh, promoted from, I would say, the late 19th century and then up through early 20th century, well, up into late 20th century. But I would say it's, it's been generally replaced. It's no longer invasion, now it's more in, uh, migration. Migration, like, yeah. okay. Uh, there's been a study, which I've, I've found to be the best study on that topic, uh, by a friend of mine, Edwin Bryant, who made this the th topic of his doctoral thesis at Harvard University. Uh, he's especially expert at bringing together the arguments from many, many, many different sources and then weighing, weighing the arguments. And what he basically concludes <laughs> From the evidence, there's archaeological evidence, there's linguistic evidence, uh, there's what else? There's a, a few other types of evidence. He says it's inconclusive. Mm. <laughs> you, you really can't say definitely one way or another. One thing that um, is often thought to be what will kind of be, be a key to open up uh, the question of the Aryan migration or whatever theory um, is uh, the, the civilization, the word's slipping my mind right now, but the, the civilization that was um, the Indus Valley civilization, which uh, has been seen to have mysteriously, seems to have disappeared about, as I remember, they say 1800 BCE, so before the Common Era, around 1800, it seems to have disappeared and went 
you know, to 3000 BCE or earlier. And um, nobody's been able to decipher their script. They've left some small seals. These are like, um, which may have been used in sending postage sort of thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, there's some interesting images on those seals, and there's some interesting marks which look like language, but nobody's been able to decipher. Now somebody, some of your followers are going to say, oh yes, we have deciphered. Um, and they will point maybe to some other video on YouTube or whatever. Um, but... Um, I mean, I don't want to say absolutely it hasn't been deciphered, but the vast majority, the, the scholars I know, <laughs> they say, no, it hasn't actually been deciphered. And that means, well, we don't really know what they're saying. Uh, if we knew what they were saying, maybe they could tell us something about this theory, and maybe we could understand whether, sorry, was uh, the Vedic tradition a continuation from them or what. So that's all. And, and historically speaking, the Vedic literature is quite mysterious because it seems to just appear at some point. Suddenly you have these hymns which are highly sophisticated in many ways. And where did it come from? Mm. So the tradition says, well, uh, they're, they, they're eternal, they're re revelation. <laughs> and Have you seen those old manuscripts? How old, uh, which one is the oldest one and where do they, uh, where it's held? Manuscripts you will not find going back earlier than approximately a thousand or even eleven hundred of the common era. That means a thousand years ago and before that, you don't find. What you can find earlier um, is stone inscriptions, copper inscriptions, mm. but these are generally found on, um, on monuments, and they're telling a, a little story about some king and how he conquered everything, and um, yeah, such information like that. But he, that's what I was saying before, the Veda has been carried over these uh, millennia orally. Mm. Just from teach, you know, teacher, teacher to, to student, to student. Yeah, by heart, they were learning by yeah, heart. Yeah, learning. And, um, and then <laughs> uh, Friedrich Max Müller, mm. who never went to India. Really? He was from Germany. <laughs> He became a professor in didn't Oxford. I know that. <laughs> the first time I hear that he never went to India. Oh. Yeah. Um, somehow or other, he organized uh, to have it, um, the Rig Veda, I don't know, transcribed and translated, and then he published that. And the tradition, uh, the traditional Brahmins in India, some of them said, this is the beginning of the end of our tradition. And others said, no, no, this is great. Finally, our tradition is going to world, you know, be, yeah, go world, to the yeah. world. Um, so do you think we? that yeah. Max Miller made a disservice or a service to the humanity? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> he was an, I think he was an interesting character, and I mm -hmm. think he meant well. Mm -hmm. Um, but his, his view of the Vedic tradition was, um, what's the word? He considered it um, fascinating, but he considered it to be uh, an ex uh, the record of the childhood of humanity. In other words, he thought we've advanced so much more from that time, and it's also valuable to look back at our childhood. Mm. But he saw it as childhood only. He didn't, he didn't, we could say he missed the point. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So when you were speaking about, you know, persons, you know, going on YouTube, watching different videos, you know, they know it all. Mm. There is always uh, something, you know, and especially in these areas, uh, there is a theory which is kind of popular where they say that Vedas actually 
come from uh, Russia, from Serbia, from Bulgaria, like from Slavic regions, mm -hmm. that those people brought Vedas to India. What do you say on this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything of... Because of the similarity of Sanskrit right. words, I guess. Yeah, uh, as a scholar, I, the first thing I'd have to say is I don't know, um, because I don't, I don't know how they're making those claims. What are, on what basis, maybe they have some arguments. Uh, but just to see similarities in words doesn't really prove anything. There's a lot of, um, there's endless debate about how uh, different cultures relate to each other. You know, there's what are called diffusion theories that, okay, something starts here and it gets diffused around the world. Um, and it's all highly inconclusive. Uh, but what I would say is, why not um, agree that there would be sages in uh, the Slavic countries in very ancient times, speaking and, and writing, and why not some of what they might have spoken and written have seeped into India and then in India become developed and go back out. Something that uh, scholars of ancient trade have been saying, I think for several decades now, is there's been a lot more communication around the world uh, through trade in very ancient times, Roman times, pre-Roman times, than has been thought in the past, and so, and it can be going in so many different directions. So why not that there was something coming from Russia, from uh, other Slavic countries into India, going out again? Again, the broader sense of Veda, I think, would accommodate that idea. Yeah, thank you very much. Also, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you think uh, were like original uh, Vedic, uh, I don't know, teachings, manuscripts uh, changed? Maybe uh, things added on, things removed, like comments made which were kind of misleading. How much the Vedas today, we know today, are the same as the original ones? Because we know that yes. people have this tendency, you know, to a little bit, you know, change, you know, <laughs> add, tamper. remove, when we, where we don't like, you know? Tampering. Yeah, tampering. Yes. Um, yeah, there's been, well... I even heard, sorry to stop you, I even heard this theory uh, coming from the famous Indologist from Croatia that uh, some chapters in Bhagavad Gita were added later on. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so there's, that's what, that's one of the things that keeps indul what are called indologists busy. In, in busy, <laughs> in, in business, <laughs> uh, keeps, keeps them uh, having a chair in their university. And, uh, and it, it's a very fascinating thing. And as I mentioned about Rig Veda, it seems that, uh, you know, one can say it is, it is what it was. At the same time, the scholars of Rig Veda will say um, that there's been an, uh, a, uh, a progression of addition over time, so that uh, the hymns of the tenth mandala, there are ten what are called mandalas or parts, uh, are later than the hymns of the first, second, third, and so on, mandalas. That's one, one thing. Um, there's also a progression from these earlier Rig, Sama, Yajur, Atarva Veda texts to later texts which are still considered part of the classical Vedic corpus called, uh, well, there's the Brahmanas, there's the Aranyakas, and there are the Upanishads. And uh, in particular, the Upanishads are very much celebrated by the more philosophically interested, concerned uh, in the present day. 
And it's always uh, understood. They have come in some sense later, um, and modern scholarships, scholarship puts them from, say, the 8th eighth century of, uh, before the Common Era uh, for the classic Upanishads um, up through, I don't know, 2nd century or earlier, 4th century of the Common, before the Common Era. Mm -hmm. And then there are many other Upanishads which are considered much later. But what I wanted to say is then you come to the epics and the famous epics, there are two of them. One is the Ramayana, and one is the Mahabharata. And uh, people love to watch the dramas that are uh, performed about these because they're very dramatic. Uh, and Especially in, in India movies, you know, oh, everything yeah. is dramatic. Each glance oh, yes. is like piercing, you know, <laughs> yes. thunder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the Mahabharata in particular, um, Already in the, uh, I think we can say, 12th or 13th century, one of the highly respected commentators on the Mahabharata uh, and other Vedic texts was Madhva, Madhva Acharya. And Madhva, so many centuries ago, he said, this text has been interpolated. It's been added to, it's been changed. Um, this can't be how it has been. Um, but the effort to find an Ur text of the Mahabharata or the Ramayana, uh, generally scholars will agree that you will not find. Mm. There is no such thing as an Ur text. Because it's, first of all, it began uh, as an oral tradition. And the writing, in fact, writing was considered kind of low class. You don't write things unless you have to... Unless you have dementia. <laughs> unless, you have to, unless you have to go shopping or something. Yeah. Maybe write your shopping list. But yeah, you should remember. Yeah. yeah, you should remember important. This is important. You have to remember it. <laughs> And if you don't remember it, you don't know it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and if you, if you remember it and know it, you can speak it, and somebody else can hear it, and then they know it. Mm. That was the understanding. If you cannot remember it, it's not for you. Yeah. <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're not. You're, you don't you're have. You're not one for. <laughs> you don't have the Adi car, the qualification. Yeah, the qualification. So, but orality is super flexible. I can tell you a story and then you can tell the same story to your friends and you'll add something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then after the, um, generally understood to be after the epics comes uh, a genre of literature called the Puranas. And now we're getting into um, a genre which is all about dialogue in which someone is telling a story, reciting to someone else, uh, and that person is telling somebody else and someone else. And that's now getting written down. But the sense of uh, needing to write down exactly what someone else said, that sense is not necessarily there. Why should I have to write exactly? I mean, it, it's not necessary. Uh, I'm going to write from my realization. Or I'm a scribe and my teacher tells me to copy down this, what's already been written. I'm copying it, but some words, it's a little unclear. Okay, I'll, I'll work it out this way. And, um, or this part, ah, it's really kind of boring. Let's skip that Let's part. Let's skip that part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know a better story. <laughs> yes. So that can also happen. But there's also a sense uh, within the tradition that still all of this is 
um, is divinely inspired, that it is still revelation, and that it is to be taken um, at face value, in a sense. So one can look at it from both sides, in a sense. From the more skeptical side, you say, wait a minute, you know, there's, there's been tampering, there's been, uh, as you mentioned, about the professor who has uh, an analyzed one of the texts, the Bhagavad Gita, in this way. Um, one can look that way, and then one can come to the, we might want to say the more devotional side and say it is a, uh, it is a kind of uh, complete uh, truth as it is, and we can accept it as it is, and we can, we can uh, take it as, um, as perfect wisdom. Um, so I, I've mentioned there's, there's the building up over time, over a progression of time, and there's the sort of the idea of tampering, and that can happen in different ways. And then what happens is scholars come along and they say, well, gosh, we have, um, we have a hundred different manuscripts of, let's say, the Mahabharata. So will the real Mahabharata please stand up? <laughs> so they will sit down and create what is called a critical edition. Uh, they'll set out some criteria by which they will decide, no, this we can include, and this we're going to just put in the footnotes. Uh, and, and they're also analyzing, well, we've got a hundred uh, manuscripts. We can tell that these are related to each other, and we can tell these are related to each other. Seems like there are two branches. And this is a whole area of scholarship. People spend their whole lives uh, just doing this. The Mahabharata has, there's an, uh, a critical edition. It's, um, it's about, I don't know, it's well over 20 volumes, thick, thick volumes, um, which a whole group of scholars did in uh, India over a period of 30 years. Wow. Yeah. It's recently been translated completely into English, Whoa. and it's available uh, from Penguin. <laughs> it's quite easily available. It's a good translation. I know the translator. Anyway, uh, so critical edition, that's, that's a sort of recreation. Now, in the case of one text, which is particularly interesting for uh, one of the Hindu traditions, the so-called Vaishnava tradition, is the Bhagavata Purana. And what's particularly interesting about it in terms of this uh, question of interpolation is how minimally there are variations. All the variations that are found are very, very, very minimal and insignificant. And the reason for that is that uh, this particular text has received so much commentary from early times, from at least, uh, say, the 14th or 15th century, but also earlier, uh, so that it sort of has the, t the commentary as a way of freezing the text. Okay, this is what the commentator has commented on, so we have to take what he has commented. We can't change that. Yes. So uh, that's another phenomenon. Thank you. <clears throat> <laughs> well, that's think, really fascinating. I think I, took, I think I took you deeper than you wanted to go with no, that. No, 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 it's interesting. <laughs> it's interesting to know. I know many of our viewers are interested in such topics. Okay. I think they will be delighted to hear <laughs> such things. But I want to ask you, uh, let's move uh, more into like interreligious uh, uh, talk. Uh, so what mm -hmm. are the main similarities, but uh, also the main differences between uh, Vedic traditions and Abrahamic religions like uh, Christianity, Islam, and Judaism? What would you say? Uh, okay, the Abrahamic traditions uh, 
are often called the religion of religions of the book. Uh, they are very much uh, based on uh, written texts uh, which were put together and which came to be called in the Jew Jewish and then the Christian traditions as first the Hebrew Bible and then the Christian Bible, which included what they what the Hebrew Bible was to the Jews became the Old Testament mm. for the Christians, and they had their New Testament. Um, and this became understood as their revelation. Although there's been back and forth about inclusion and exclusion of certain, chap uh, certain books within the Bible. Uh, um, what I, well, one distinction I think is very, uh, stands out very much, is the concern in all three of the Abrahamic traditions about what is called idolatry, that what we do is not idolatry and what they do is idolatry. And the, when you really look into what is meant by idolatry, it kind of boils down to it's what they do. <laughs> and it, it develops, it, it manifests in so many uh, more specific ways. One should not worship God in some image. Um, that's, of course, one of the Ten uh, Commandments in the, uh, what is it, in Exodus and in other, one other book. So, so I think that becomes a really, really major issue in the Abrahamic traditions is we are the ones who don't uh, worship images. And we kind of see the opposite of that in what came to be called Hinduism, where you've got images all over the place. Yes. You've got thousands Pictures, pictures statues, and like. statues, temples with deities, murtis, all over India. And it's almost the opposite in saying, what? Not worship God in an image? Why not? God is merciful. He will appear. He can appear in so many ways. Why not in this form? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so that's there. Um, um, it's often said that the um, uh, Abrahamic traditions have a founder, whereas the Hindu traditions don't have a founder. Well, you could say the Hindu traditions, plural, have many founders, and then you could look at individual of those traditions and say, well, they're also founders. Uh, so, so in that sense, maybe there's not a whole uh, lot of difference. Um, it's, of course, very difficult to generalize uh, also Abrahamic traditions. After all, look at the vast differences between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, how they see each other. Um, of course, there are among them some who appreciate similarities. There is, of course, in Islam, uh, many of the, uh, the prophets of uh, Judaism and Christianity are acknowledged in, in their own way within Islam and so on. Another kind of distinction that's sometimes made, but again, we kind of go back to Hinduism, whatever you say about it, the opposite's also true. <laughs> so sometimes it's said the uh, Abrahamic traditions are religions, are prophetic religions, where the key idea is that God calls upon someone uh, to communicate his message to the people. And it's always a message of reform, it's a message uh, which is, um, in some sense, radical 
um, which is uh, subversive, politically subversive, uh, that, that can be there in prophetic religion. And then here comes the overgeneralization about the Hindu traditions or Indian or Vedic traditions is they're more about meditation and therefore they're more about uh, sort of directing one's attention within uh, within oneself to, to find oneself, to question, and um, here I think is a prominent feature of this tradition, to question, who am I actually? I'm thinking I am so many different things, but who am I actually? Uh, what is my, and what is my, um, what is my duty? That gets back to Dharma. What is my duty in this life? Uh, so that, that could be one way of making a distinction. Now there's been an interesting phenomenon uh, which uh, one scholar uh, calls the Semiticization of Hinduism. That since the 20th century or starting in the or late 19th, 20th century with the British presence in India, with the um, Christian presence in India, there was a sense among uh, people of India that, oh, gosh, there's this big challenge to our ways of life and our religion and our ways of seeing the world, and they're attacking us with uh, their Christianity. Uh, we, have to, we have to stand up to this and we have to say, what, uh, what is our faith? And so when they came with their religion of the book, uh, the Hindus said, well, we also have a book. Uh, which book? Gosh, we've got so many books. <laughs> which one should we take? Bhagavad Gita. Yes, let's take Bhagavad Gita. And that became, especially in the 19th, especially late 19th century, and then from there, uh, it became popularized as sort of we also have a book. Um, but it's gone beyond that. Semiticization um, brings in a lot of the, the, the whole notion that, mm, like someone says, I am a Christian. So now people are saying, I am a Hindu, where earlier they wouldn't have really said that. They would have said, well, um, I worship Shiva, I worship Vishnu, um, I'm from this jati, which is another subject that's come to be called caste. Mm. Um, I'm part of this clan, and I live in this part of India, and this is how we live, and this is what we do. But they wouldn't have said, I'm a Hindu. That idea came from the West. Yes, as you explained, yeah. And it's, un it's had very unfortunate consequences in uh, present-day India uh, with so much tension uh, between the uh, Hindus, so-called, on one side, Muslims, so-called, on another side, Christians, and uh, there's been a lot of uh, very dark history as a yes. result. Yes, yes. But you were uh, talking about idolatry, uh, and um, we, uh, we know, I mean, I've been to India also, and we see there's a deity behind your back. Mm -hmm. uh, why uh, is given, uh, Vedas give so much importance to the deity worship, of the worship of the stat statues? What, what's the philosophy behind it? Okay, I guess, uh, I guess I asked for it because I mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that's something, that's what... Because it's very prominent. It is. And that's what I particularly studied. That's what I did my doctoral research on. Uh, I studied one particular temple in present-day Vrindavan, uh, the Radharaman Temple, and uh, spent some months there, and uh, it was quite fascinating. They have a particularly interesting uh, image of Krishna, uh, who is... We, they would say who, not 
which, but who is quite small. It's like this size. And uh, he, Krishna, has been worshipped uh, for the last 470 years, something like that. And the story is that this was what they call a self-manifest uh, image or, or deity. And there's a whole story how he is said to have manifest to this particular uh, sadhu or sage uh, named Gopal Bhatta. So one basic idea of uh, deity and deity worship is that here we are, we're, we have bodies, physical bodies, and we have physical senses. We see uh, through our eyes and, and uh, we, we have our five senses. And we want to experience uh, spiritual reality. We want to experience the form of God. And this is a key idea which develops or which manifests especially in the Bhagavad Gita and especially in, I mentioned before, the Bhagavata Purana, that God has form. What sort of form? Well, sat chit ananda vigraha, a form which is uh, com constituted of eternity, knowledge, and ananda, sometimes translated as bliss, uh, or joy, un unending joy, ananda, without end and free from darkness. Uh, God has a form, but we cannot experience that form because our senses are f uh, only attuned to or can relate to or connect with physical things. But God is all-powerful, and God is uh, desiring, um, we have desire, God has desire, and his uh, most fundamental desire is that we connect with him, and that's where the word yoga has a very uh, fundamental sense. Uh, uh, the yoga means to connect. So to connect ourselves with God, how to do it? Well, God is kind, so he appears in this world in many ways. And one of the ways he appears is in a physical form. Physical form which then can be uh, can be engaged, can be seen, first of all. The word darshan is there. It's a very key word, the idea of, uh, of seeing the divinity in his form and being seen. Diana Eck, a scholar also from Harvard, wrote uh, a little book which became hugely popular and was um, used as a textbook, probably still is, in American universities introducing Hinduism. Uh, the book is simply called Darshan. There's a subtitle. And she's explaining in there one of the key ideas of Darshan is that you go in the temple and um, kind of present yourself before God. There he is. He's, he's up there on the altar and you're looking at him and he's looking at you. <laughs> and so the darshan is going both ways. And so you're getting the sense that uh, you are being reminded that actually God is everywhere and God is always looking at me. That's a kind of instrumental way of understanding the, the deity, but it is... Um, it is a key idea that uh, is uh, showing that there is a sense that the supreme truth, the supreme reality, which is what Veda is very concerned with, um, is ultimately, we can understand, is personal, is, is a person. And this brings in an interesting question of going back to the uh, Abrahamic traditions, we always say they are monotheistic. Yeah. And people say, and Hinduism is 
Polytheism. Polytheism. We are pagans. <laughs> right? <laughs> Polytheism, paganism. And, well, maybe so if you take polytheism in a certain way, but if you want to go a little deeper, uh, you may find that it's a kind of monotheism. But it's a multi-formed monotheism. God, being all-powerful, can appear in so many different forms with different purposes. And different names, of course. And different names, indeed. <laughs> There is also a um, thing uh, called, I mean, it's a household word, ahimsa. Mm. So when we uh, speak about Vedas, we immediately think of this term, ahimsa, non-violence. Mm. You also wrote a book about it, yes. which can be downloaded where? Uh, it can be downloaded if you search the title of the book, you'll come right to the page of the publisher. Uh, where the book can be downloaded um, without yeah. cost. We will put description in a video. Yeah, yeah. We, are. we, we can put, if link. you can put the link. Cow care also. in Hindu animal ethics. So I guess my question is, why is it has been given so much importance, as not just uh, being non-violent to human beings, but to all entities mm. and uh, people being vegetarian. Mm -hmm. But we see, in, for example, in uh, Abrahamic religions, they allow for killing animals for food, mm -hmm. or mildly say they don't frown upon it. Right. So what do you think of it? Why? Why, why this? Okay, let's uh, look at the word ahimsa first. Ahimsa uh, is generally translated as violence. And again, I mentioned before, you put an a uh, short a before it and that negates, so the opposite. So mm. it's typically translated as non-violence, uh, although it has a quite rich meaning beyond that. And um, it can be argued historically that the idea of ahimsa kind of emerges out of um, the fact that one of the practices of early Vedic tradition was a ritual involving the, uh, the ritual killing, the sacrificing of animals. And as that was going on, there was also a questioning of that whole process. And that questioning seems to have become louder and louder over time. And uh, it can be argued that the whole Buddhist tradition was a protest against that as also the Jain tradition, which makes the principle of ahimsa uh, the core of their entire system, their entire philosophy. Um, ahimsa is, if we take it simply as nonviolence, is a recognition, I, let me put it this way, it's starting with a recognition or an acknowledgement that there is violence in this world, biotic violence. To live, we must eat. To eat, we must kill. And the question comes, what to kill? <laughs> and so we uh, find this, uh, a statement in, um, it's in the Mahabharata, it's in the Bhagavata Purana. In Sanskrit, shall I quote a Sanskrit? Why not, definitely. Ahastani sahastanam apadanis chatuspadam palguni tatramahatam jivo jivasya jivanam. Uh, it's saying that, well, literally, those without hands are food for those with hands. In other words, plants are food for uh, those with hands or those with apadani chatuspadam. Uh, those Apadani, without feet, plants, are food for those with four hands, with four feet, sorry. Palguni <clears> tatramahatam, <throat> and the general principle is that the weak are food for the strong, and life is life for life. Jivo jiva sejivano. <laughs> so that's the reality we live in. It's a very, uh, it's a, 
kind of sad situation. It's brutal. <laughs> it's brutal. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is it? Nature with uh, red tooth and claw. Um, and so we as human beings are reflective beings and we are trying to see uh, what is the proper way to live? Is there something called a proper way to live? And out of that we can say the, the principle of ahimsa uh, comes out and expands. And in the Mahabharata it's said that um, the, of all principles of dharma, which we said was ethics, the highest principle is ahimsa. The highest principle is ahimsa. And then we find in uh, the classic yoga text, this is uh, called the Yoga Sutra, Patanjali Yoga Sutra. Uh, it's a short text, and more and more yoga people are studying it. And we find there, uh, uh, Patanjali refers to the, the very first step in the very first step <laughs> of yoga. Uh, the first of eight steps is called yama, which means restraint, self-restraint. It's basically saying, hey, you want to do yoga, you're going to have to learn to control your, your behavior. How? Start with ahimsa. Start with what you eat. Start with, uh, you know, looking at your diet. But what is interesting is that the commentators, the traditional commentators, when they speak, uh, when they write on ahimsa in yoga, they say this is foundational and it, um, all the other principles are rooted in ahimsa. So if you get ahimsa right, you get all the others right. And vice versa, if you get uh, there's, there's five principles of restraint, there's five principles of observances. That can be a whole other podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then um, if you get those right, it's only so if you're getting, by that, you're getting a himsa right. Mm. Uh, in other words, what's happening is one is learning to recognize that, hey, I'm a living being, and I want to keep my life. And here's another living being. It may be, I wrote specifically about cows in this book. Uh, it may be cows. They also want to preserve their life. Do you really need to eat them? <laughs> uh, what if you would instead, um, and it's been shown uh, by several uh, scholars uh, that economically, ecologically, in terms of climate uh, preservation and so on, it does not make sense that we are killing animals, especially at the rate we are, which is uh, something between 60 and 80 billion land animals per year. So, so this is yoga. Yoga means uh, start looking at yourself and what do I really need to maintain myself? And how can I uh, minimize my karmic footprint mm. <laughs> in this, on this planet? We're making such a mess of the planet because of uh, overindulgence. It really boils down to that. That's what the Vedic tradition is saying. Yeah, and then when you say, like for example, to person, yeah, you think about, you know, becoming vegetarian, and then the person say, yeah, but you also kill plants. You kill plants, it's the same. What do you say on that? Uh, is it really the same? Can no, you? it's definitely <laughs> not, but it's like, you know. <laughs> yeah. Can, can, you, can you look at an animal with the two eyes looking at you and then take a knife to that because you want to eat that? Uh, is that the same as taking tomatoes as taking, uh, you know, so many uh, parts of plants, taking wheat plant, which is, uh, you know, the, the grains which are, they are falling uh, to the ground. 
So there's 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 a world of difference. Yeah, and, I agree. And the the Vedic literature makes dis these distinctions and argues that this is something that humans can do, is we can make such distinctions. And we can make them for a reason. Uh, we can make them so that making the better choice, we can eventually, we can benefit the world around us, benefit ourselves, and eventually free ourselves from the illusions and the miseries that we're suffering. Yeah. Let's move into this term called Kali Yuga because everyone speaks uh, now about it. Uh, not, it's like this world has become a household w word, everyone knows about it. Vedas describe that we live in a Kali Yuga. What is this Kali Yuga and what is the prophecy for our future? Uh, let me get out my crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> Where did I put my crystal ball? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Kali, Are we living the, our final hour, <laughs> yes, final it's, times? Yes, it's, it's coming just around the corner. Second well, coming of Christ, you know, at, eternal at the destruction. Rate, <laughs> at, at the rate we're going, we may be at each other's throats sooner than we think just to survive. Um, this idea of yugas uh, is as far as I know, appears uh, not explicitly until the Mahabharata. And it's, uh, ex uh, the idea is it's cyclical time. This is the more essential idea, is that time is cyclical. Um, and we experience that daily, <laughs> the sun rotating and so on. Uh, but there are long cycles, short cycles, extremely long cycles. And there are four very long cycles. Uh, the last of the four being what's called Kali. And this word Kali is the same word as um, in Indian dice. When you play dice, mm. their dice are uh, not like cubes but they're long and they have four sides. They have two ends and four sides. And uh, the, four, the names of the four sides are uh, Krita, Treta, Dvapara, and Kali. Uh, Krita means four and it also means, literally it means done, which means you won. <laughs> you have won, won the throw. Um, Treta means three, Dvapara means two, and Kali means one, and Kali is the loser, uh, the uh, throw. And uh, so... So we're losers. So we're losers. <laughs> <laughs> we're losers, yeah. And uh, things are um, degrading uh, instead of... Um, Instead of evolution, you could say there's more devolution. And uh, there's a nice book on that subject uh, from a friend of mine. Ah, oh, we have it there. Yeah. Michael Kramer. Hum yes. Yeah, human devolution. Human devolution. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Uh, and there's different theories about the lengths of, of these yugas. The one which I'm familiar with is that these are very long periods and that this final period we're in, uh, we're only at the beginning of it. So we're, it's going to get a lot worse before it'll get better. Uh, the, it's saying that we have uh, four, more than 400,000 years to go. Um, so don't hold your breath mm. for the end of it. Um, but it is a, a fairly gradual process. But Others will say, no, it's not 400,000 years, it's maybe 1,200 years. Uh, others will say, well, it's, it's much more relative uh, term. It's not exactly a set number of years. It's, it's, it can be understood in more relational terms uh, in, context, in different contexts. But... Um, there is certainly this sense which comes, which uh, especially starts in the Mahabharata, that things are winding down. It's, it's said, um, 
in, in the Bhagavata Purana uh, that in this age, how does it go? Manda Sumanda Matayo. That uh, this, what, is, what characterizes this age is that we human beings are Manda, which means slow or dull. Sumanda Mati, uh, which means the Mati, the mind, is really dull. <laughs> And manda bhag, uh, bhagya, we are unfortunate. Uh, and uh, upadruta, and we well, one translation is we we tend to be, we tend to fight, we tend to be quarrelsome. Yes. Have you noticed? Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is our, this is kind of the situation we're in. But also some say that there is kind of golden age in this Kali Yuga. Do you know anything about this? That golden. during the Kali Yuga yeah. that we are now living or approaching like a little mini golden age. Yes, that's follow, that idea comes in, the, uh, in particular in the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. The Vaishnavas I mentioned before, uh, they are worshipping Vishnu and more specifically they worship Krishna. And more specifically, the Gaudiya Vaishnavas worship Sri Chaitanya as Krishna, and he advented uh, in the late 16th, sorry, 15th century. And it's understood that since he appeared personally and taught a method for sort of um, protecting oneself from this, uh, the effects of this age, uh, and, and taught a practice of dharma, which is practical, which can be practiced in this age. It's um, therefore we have a, a golden age that we're in. That's the understanding. So we are living in a golden age of Kali Yuga at the moment. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> Amazing. So let's now move a little bit more into the philosophy of uh, Puranas. Uh, uh, namely, Shrimad Bhagavatam, I love it, I read it. There is a whole set there. I have uh -huh. it on English, have it on uh, Serbian, Croatian, few uh, like first and second canto. So they are full of descriptions uh, about the uh, purpose of our life, about who we truly are. So can you explain, according to Puranas, Vedas, who are we? What is the purpose of our life? I mean, why do we live? Why do we die? Yeah, I think we all have that question, especially when we're, very, very, when we're children, isn't it? We all at some point stopped and asked ourselves, What's the point? What's the point? <laughs> I remember distinctly uh, asking myself, how is it that th this is my mother and this is my father? Why wasn't I born in that family over there or that family, but I'm in this family? How did that happen? So the questioning, you could say this is the uh, the 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 beginning point, especially as you mentioned in the Bhagavata Purana, uh, is, uh, is a recognition that we have, as human beings, this special capacity to question. And the whole Bhagavata Purana is built on questions. Uh, it's uh, the first and sort of found, founding question of the king uh, who is questioning the sage. Shuka is the sage's name. Uh, the king has been condemned to die. He's been cursed. He's going to die in seven days. And he knows it. And he realizes there's no point in fighting against it. Now this is uh, just as a footnote. The Mahabharata tells a very different story. It says the king tried to fight against it. He tried to avoid it. They don't tell you that uh, in the abridged editions of the Mahabharata, but he tries to avoid it. Uh, the Bhagavatam says, no, he didn't. He wasn't so foolish as to try to avoid it. 
he recognized, this is my time. I have seven days and seven nights to live. What do I do with these, this short time that I have? Uh, he does the, the right thing. He approaches a sage, Shuka is his name, who is well-versed and, we say, realized uh, in the knowledge of the Veda and specifically the, this book, the Bhagavata Purana, about which we made a film. That's something else you can maybe give a link to. Yeah, definitely. It's amazing. I watched it like last night. And when you <laughs> when did you publish that uh, documentary? We published it. Well, it's been. I mean, over when a year was it released? Ago. Over a year. That's amazing. Yeah. I will put definitely a link in the video. Good. So, um, and his question is, what is the duty of a person who's about to die? So it, it's there's this idea again of what should I do which means there's a sense of should. I, there's an, a sense of ought, not only of I want, but what should I do? Uh, and so uh, this, this leads into this um, discourse which expands out and unfolds through many, many narratives uh, to understand, uh, first of all, who am I and uh, who or what is ultimate truth and what is ultimate purpose. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a long story that kind of brings you to the point gradually of understanding, okay, this is really, this is important. And the very first verse of the Bhagavata kind of sum, takes the whole 12 uh, skandhas, they're called, or uh, cantos, and uh, <laughs> shrinks it all together in one verse. And this one verse, uh, I'll just recite the last line, dhamna svena sada nirasta kuhakam satyam param dhimahi. And this satyam param, satyam means truth, param means supreme or ultimate. So it's, it's a kind of invitation. Now let's meditate. Dimahi means let us meditate. On what? Let's meditate on the ultimate truth. We've been meditating on everything. We've been meditating on how to enjoy life uh, for many lifetimes. This is the idea. We've tried We've tried and we've tried again, <laughs> repeatedly. Chewing the chewed. <laughs> that expression, that expression <laughs> is there, yeah. Puna punas charvita charvan anam is the Sanskrit. That again and again I'm chewing what has already been chewed. And spit it. <laughs> and, yeah. so, uh, so here it's saying satyam param dimahi. Let's meditate on the supreme truth. Okay, well, what is that? All right, then uh, that's what the Bhagavata Purana is introducing. And it comes to uh, the grand finale, in a sense, is in the tenth. It has 12 uh, parts, skandhas, but the tenth is by far the, uh, the, the longest and is most central. And there it celebrates uh, the, the appearance of uh, the Supreme Truth as Krishna. Krishna is that Supreme Truth, uh, also referred to as Bhagavan. So um, what are we doing here? Well, who are we? What are we doing? The Bhagavatam in particular and most explicitly, it's sort of hinted at and it's hard to find in other texts, but in the Bhagavatam, it kind of says, okay, now we're just going to spell it out for you <laughs> that uh, the purpose of life is to develop our uh, relationship, which is a loving relationship with the Supreme Being, the Supreme Truth, who is a person as we are persons, who, with whom 
there is reciprocation uh, with whom uh, a relationship can be, can unfold, which never ends, which simply gets better and better the more we, uh, the more we engage in that relationship. So the Bhagavatam is uh, giving that message, and it's giving it in a quite amazing way. Yeah. We have in our rap shop also, we are offering Srimad Bhagavatam on creation, the first and oh, yeah. the second canto. Uh -huh. Yeah, people. Now people there's, maybe I about. can put in another little plug, um, another book which I've done, uh, co-authored with a very good friend of mine, a professor in America, Ravi Gupta is uh, a, a one-volume selections from the Bhagavata Purana translations mm. with summaries of all the parts that we don't translate so you can get the whole, the whole picture. Amazing. And that's called uh, The Bhagavata Purana Selected Readings. Mm. And it was published uh, by Columbia University Press. Amazing. So when we speak about uh, the purpose of our life, we always uh, connect this term karma and uh, samsara. Sam, samsa, how, do, how do I spell it? Sam, samsara. Samsara. Karma yeah. and samsara. Yeah. They are laws of the uh, universe. Uh, what are they, actually? Can you, can you give us a little explanation of what is karma and how it affects us? Karma and samsara. Maybe we start with samsara. Yes. <laughs> Sangsara is uh, a nice word because it, the, it's onomatopoeic. It has a sound which suggests what it's referring to. And what it's referring to is the flow. Uh, sara can have the sense of flowing. Uh, the flowing of life um, in, a, in a cycle, in a circle cycle, uh, which continues after this life. So we sometimes speak of uh, the repetition of birth, old age, disease, and death, as is mentioned in Bhagavad Gita. Another way of putting that is repeated death and rebirth. So the death that we're all facing ahead of us in the, from this life, um, we are told, reassured, if you like, uh, don't worry, you'll be reborn again. And for some, that's a great, re a great relief uh, to hear, uh, oh, I'll be reborn again. Yes, you'll be reborn again, but where are you going to be reborn? Um, and are you going to be, maybe you'll be reborn as a human being, but maybe you'll be born in a, in a, in a country which is, you know, extremely poor, where there's war going on, or whatever. Uh, or maybe you won't be reborn as a human being. So, so, okay, you're saying maybe, maybe, how do I know? Well, it has to do with karma. And what is karma? Literally, karma just means action. Uh, and it's everything that we're doing as we speak and as we think. And when we do something, um, that's all karma. And wherever there is action, as the physicists tell us in conventional uh, Newtonian physics, wherever there's an action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So there's some sort of effect uh, an effect which will come back to us. What goes around comes around, as they say, as ye sow, so shall ye reap, is there in the, in the Bible. So they don't use the word karma, but they seem to have the idea of karma also in the, in the Bible. Oh, okay, so then it's how I act that's going to determine also what I am in my next life? Yes. 
oh, so how would I change it so that I get a good, I can have a good life? Well, you can do nice things for people. You can uh, give a lot in charity. You can be, be pious. You can uh, avoid act, self-destructive activities. There are a lot of things you can do. There's um, so many descriptions within Vedic literature of what you can do. But there's a catch. What? There's a catch. Yes, there's a catch. The catch is you may do some very nice things in this life and get a very nice body in your next life, be born in a very nice wealthy family. And then what happens maybe in that wealthy family, um, happy family, some tragedy happens. Maybe it's one of your own children suddenly dies and you're heartbroken. You say, why? Why did this have to happen? Well, maybe it had to happen because of that person's previous karma, but also your own previous karma. Maybe you don't remember, but something you've done. So this is one of the objections to the idea of karma. But I don't remember what I did in my previous life. How does this uh, help me in this life uh, to... Um, you know, be taught a lesson from something I did wrong in my previous life. Well, there are a lot of things we forget within this life. Definitely. Do we remember just what we were doing at this time a week ago? No. <laughs> <laughs> so we're essentially forgetful beings, but there's someone who always remembers, and that is uh, referred to in the Bhagavad Gita as Param Atma. Atma means self, that's us. And Paramatma, that's the, you, want to, you may want to say, super self, uh, who's always with us. And that goes quite far back in the Veda. It goes all the way back to the Rig Veda, and then again in the Upanishads, this beautiful analogy of uh, two birds in a tree. One bird is busy, busy, busy eating the fruit, in the tree, and the other bird is simply watching uh, the first bird eat. And so the one bird, that's us, and the other bird, that's the Paramatma. And so that Paramatma is always watching. And um, as long as we ignore Paramatma, we'll be very much uh, implicated by our actions, karma. So the conclusion might be, someone would reasonably conclude, okay, so that means the way to get out of this mess is stop acting. I will stop. I won't do anything. I'm just going to sit, I'm going to meditate. And that's what's being explained, especially in, um, well, throughout the Bhagavad Gita, but especially in the beginning, a uh, few chapters. It's not possible. You it's can't, not going to work. <laughs> you can't stop acting. Your so-called not acting is another form of acting. Okay, well, if that's the case, what am I supposed to do? Um, if acting is getting me in trouble and not acting is also getting me in trouble, what am I supposed to do? Uh, that's what the Bhagavad Gita is about. It's about rising above both action and inaction, by completely revising our sense of motivation um, based on an understanding of who we actually are and what it is that makes one actually uh, peaceful, satisfied, happy, which is um, a happiness which real happiness has to come from within. Many people know that. Yes. Uh, but to kind of really know it, <laughs> that's, that's what we want to pursue according to the, these texts. So in this way we stop this wheel of samsara. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's described as a wheel. And where do we go from there? Ah, ah. ah <laughs> where do we go from there? Yes, that's the interesting. Then it gets interesting. And uh, this is where we might want to say there's an interesting departure between Buddhist traditions, for the most part, 
and uh, so-called Hindu traditions, and particularly the Vaishnava traditions, where um, the Buddhist traditions generally will uh, speak of this uh, liberation from the cycle, and they refer to it as nirvana, and nirvana literally means extinguishment. Like you blow out a candle, uh, you extinguish the candle. Hmm. The, the Vaishnavas will say, no, we don't want that, thank you very much. We don't want to extinguish ourselves, and even if we wanted to, you couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so what to do? Well, how about going to a realm which is completely beyond the realm of karma? Could it be that there is such a realm? This goes back to Rig Veda, that there are... There is a portion of reality, uh, it, it kind of, to get the sense of things, it uses a bit of mathematics. It says there's this three quarter, there's this one quarter realm and there's the three quarter realm. And the one quarter realm, that's where we are now. And the three quarter realm, that's where we want to go. In other words, it's, it's a realm which is much more expansive and the word Brahman, which is sometimes in the uh, Vedanta tradition in the Upanishads, is the word, the sort of one word um, emblem of this ultimate reality. Brahman literally means that which is expanding. It's expanding. So, uh, so this tradition would say it's not about snuffing out life. It's, it's where life really starts. It's where we can wake up to our real identity in relation to the higher self and um, engaging in that relationship uh, from then on. That leads me like naturally to my uh, next question and that is, what is the absolute truth? Ta-da! <laughs> the final question. You know, one truth for all. Yes. How do Vedas describe the absolute truth? The absolute truth. I mentioned satyam param, dimahi. Well, it's not something that you articulate in one interview necessarily. Yeah, well, let's do it like <laughs> shortly if we can. <laughs> yeah, we understand. Let's take the Bhagavata Purana. Uh, there the absolute truth is described as having three aspects or three ways of seeing it. I just mentioned Brahman. And Brahman is sometimes uh, as a kind of metaphor perhaps, but it's compared to uh, a sort of unlimited light. So people say, I see the light. Um, yes, that might be a kind of realization of this Brahman as an aspect, as a as a basic dimension of this absolute reality, uh, which, which is eternal. But it goes beyond that, and we've mentioned already, Paramatman, Paramatma, uh, this is the higher self. And the higher self is, okay, we take the light, uh, which is, we see the light, and as a very rough analogy, we look uh, into a, uh, a lake surface and the waves are waving and we see the sparkle of the sun on those waves. Each wave, there's a, there's a sparkling sun. And each of those sparkling uh, reflections from the sun might be compared to Paramatma. That's, that's that the higher self present in you, in me, in everyone who is watching us now, and in the cows, and in all living beings, all creatures. Uh, so that would be one, a second level, and a more kind of specified level, and it's a level of reality which now comes more into relating how we act in this world, how do we make decisions? Well, 
we don't notice, but Paramatma is there helping us, nudging us this way, that way, giving us intelligence, re giving us memory. Like how intuition, to act. some some kind can of can be yeah. intuition. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah. What we call intuition may actually be Paramatma. Maybe or may not be. <laughs> yes, <laughs> can also we may think. And then the third uh, category of understanding of the same satyam params, same truth, is Bhagavan. Um, and the word Bhagavan is Sanskrit, little Sanskrit lesson. Okay, Bhaga uh, means share. Like if you're a business person and you are a shareholder in a company, I have 50% shares in this company. Uh, that means you have 50% bhaga. And bhagavan, van means possessor, one who possesses shares. Um, if a person possesses all the shares in a company, you could call him the bhagavan of that company. So the term bhagavan in relation to absolute truth means that person to whom all shares, that is, all wealth, all what we could call opulence, um, is possessed by that person. And it, it points to a person, a person. Nowadays, people like to talk a lot about energy. Yes. Universal energy. <laughs> That's true. I want to, you know, become one with uh, the energies of the world. Or... Um, I want to relate with the universe and the energy of the universe. Um, yes, there are energies, but if we think a little about how energies work, uh, we can trace them back to someone behind the energy. There's always a person behind energy. We don't usually think of it that way, but there is. And we ourselves are examples of that. We have energy, we exercise energy in, we have, in Sanskrit, shakti, we have powers of speech, for example. Um, anyway, so Bhagavan is that person. And then the Bhagavata Purana is unfolding. Okay, Bhagavan, so how do we understand uh, this person Bhagavan? The main emphasis is on this supreme person uh, uh, who is our, uh, described in the Bhagavad Gita as our best well-wisher. So how, how can one, you said everyone's talking about energy, but how can you have a relationship with energy? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of too abstract. Exactly. Even boring. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. It's not attractive to me at all. I prefer, you know, seeing God as a, as a person. Also, he has, of course, energies, but you can have a relationship with a, with a yeah. person. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, you are also sannyasi, a swami. Uh, what does that mean? Which uh, vows uh, and practices are you practicing? <laughs> what does, how, how does your day look like? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, there is a tradition uh, which is centuries old in India, possibly long, longer, uh, of uh, recognizing that we go through different life stages. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a general division of four stages. You can be a student, uh, as a child, and then uh, becoming a formal student, this is all one stage. And then uh, eventually most people will marry and take the responsibilities of, of the family. And after some years, mm. children become grown up. Uh, the husband and the wife may, the tradition is that they may then go wandering together or separately um, for the purpose of pursuing their practices of meditation of yoga. 
And then there's a fourth stage, and that is the sannyas uh, ashram. Ashrams, they're all ashramas, or places of refuge, of shelter. And this fourth one, sannyas, is, um, again, traditionally, there's two traditions. One is you can, uh, and generally it would be males, would take sannyas when they're younger, and some, and the other tradition is, having gone through all the other three stages, then you take sannyas. Uh, the vow of sannyas, you could say it's something like in the West, uh, in the monastic tradition, it's taking final orders. Um, yeah, in the Catholic uh, monastic traditions, I think they would speak of taking final or orders, which means you're making a final lifetime commitment, which uh, it's expected you will not... Um, you will not give up uh, for the rest of this life. So the basic uh, vow of sannyas is uh, to renounce uh, the life of, of, uh, of the household, of having a family, of living with wife and children and so on. Uh, and again, traditionally it means one is a wandering monk uh, so I took the formal order of sannyas. Let's see, now it's uh, 2022 as we speak. Uh, it was uh, 2014. So it's been eight years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just eight years. <laughs> eight years ago I took, uh, took these orders. There can be, uh, again, traditionally, lots and lots of quite extreme austerities uh, for the sannyasi because it's understood now is the time when you've really got to uh, prepare for your last days. And you want to do it. The idea is uh, you don't want to end this life in some sort of distracted and maybe unconscious state or whatever. You want to be as awake as possible uh, because you want, to, um, you want to make that, that leap, really, from this one-quarter uh, reality I mentioned to the three-quarter reality. Uh, and uh, to do that, you want to be very conscious. And to do that, you want to become uh, aloof from the what are always called dualities of this existence. Uh, as long as we have these bodies, we experience dualities. We experience heat and cold. We experience uh, happiness and distress. We experience possibly reputation or loss of reputation. These are the, especially these three are mentioned as the sort of things we're concerned about. And yoga is about finding a way to stand above these dualities and just not that one becomes unaware of them, but rather one becomes aware, okay. It's like this now, but this is not me. So sannyas is really about working in a more conscious way on that. But also in this modern time, here I am, um, not dressed as a traditional sannyasi at the moment, uh, and I'm traveling and, and I'm giving lectures in universities mm. and, and uh, I'm writing a book and and so on. What is that to do with sannyas? Well, it's about also sharing uh, this knowledge, sharing this wisdom uh, with others. Because as we said earlier, this is the age of Kali. And if we can, uh, you know, do something to help people wake up 
uh, and get an opportunity to free themselves. And uh, even in this life, you know, just forget about liberation and three quarters, Vaikuntha, just living a more decent life in this life uh, by uh, understanding how to uh, better live in relation to others. That's what sannyasa is about, helping others. So the sannyas can have a, quite a variety of duties, including being something like a, uh, one who does pastoral care. Yeah, care. Like a spiritual master. Yeah, it can be a the, spiritual leading guide. The, yeah, disciples giving initiations. That's yeah. there also. Yeah. yeah. And also, like uh, academic, your academic achievements, studying, traveling, giving. You're very much, you know, busy <laughs> traveling all around the globe. And sometimes I think maybe it's time to stay in one place. <laughs> no, please don't stay. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> So what would you advise to, to people, who, to our viewers who are interested in, in these Vedic practices, and especially in Bhakti Yoga, how to start, uh, which kind of books to read, uh, yeah. uh, what practices, uh, <clears throat> which habits to incorporate, or, or which practices to avoid in order to, know, you know, to <laughs> make better, um, how to say, spiritual advancement? Yeah. Well, okay, start with reading. We've mentioned it several times, Bhagavad Gita. Start with reading. Start with reading. Bhagavad Gita is a good start, although it can also be a bit formidable, the first chapter of Bhagavad Gita, because you suddenly encounter all these very strange names that you're not familiar with, because it's a carryover from what's happening in the Mahabharata. But okay, you can practically skip to chapter two <laughs> and go from there and get um, the basic teachings that Krishna is giving uh, to understand. We, we are intelligent beings. We want to know why we're doing something, and Bhagavad Gita is helping in that purpose. Why, why take up you know, spiritual practice, and what is the aim, and as you said, what to avoid and so on. So Bhagavad Gita is good for that. It's also good to make an effort to find others who are pursuing the same. And I have to say, you mentioned the word uh, spiritual master. Sooner or later, actually the fact is you cannot get very far at all without a someone who's accomplished in the, in the practice. There are people who say, well, I'm my own guru. Yes, you're your own guru, but if you're your own guru, uh, you really have a fool for a disciple. <laughs> so it's not going to, uh, it's, it's not going to get you very far. <laughs> Uh, of course, there can be exceptions, but don't think you're the exception. Um, don't think I will get an honorary doctorate just by, you know, expecting one to come to me. That's the idea. We need to work for it. Uh, so that's something to look towards. Okay, maybe I'm, you know, not so clever myself. Even I do the reading, maybe I'm going to need some guidance. Yes, you're going to, and Krishna explains, the whole Gita is Krishna acting as guru for uh, Arjuna, who's acting as his student. Uh, so taking on, it said, the best way to read the Bhagavad Gita is in the mood of Arjuna, if one can try to imbibe that mood. Uh, and then what else can I do? Well, I mentioned before, we can ask ourselves, do I really need to eat these things uh, which are costing the lives of other highly conscious beings? Maybe not. And then get yourself a good vegetarian cookbook, learn how to cook, or vegan, and that's a whole other topic, veg vegetarian or vegan. 
uh, start out vegetarian at least, and maybe you can go uh, eventually to being vegan. Uh, there's there's a an option. There's a third option, what I call a himsa vegan, taking dairy products in particular from cows that are protected their entire life. And there's not many of them. Yeah. So it probably means for most people being practically vegan. It's a nice position to take. Um, so changing habits like this. And then also there are meditations that one can practice. But again, this is essentially done uh, under guidance with a teacher, with a, with a master, uh, in particular, because nowadays yoga, uh, nowadays meaning this age of Kali, extremely difficult to do much of what uh, traditional yogis would do. But uh, in particular in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna speaks about bhakti yoga. And with bhakti, which means devotion or devotional service, uh, one can really kind of from day one start uh, take up practices uh, which can be yoga, which are connecting oneself in a spiritual way. And one of these practices is uh, using the tongue for eating, but also for, uh, for speaking, and also for what some call chanting, which is some repetition of, uh, of spiritual sound vibration, mantras. And there are any number of mantras that are recommended. And we mentioned Chaitanya previously, Sri Chaitanya, yes. Golden Age. Mm -hmm. So he, in particular, recommended to chant uh, what's also become kind of a household expression, the Hare Krishna mantra. Yes. Yeah. So that's um, very nice to chant and to sing. And that's something your YouTube followers will like. I think they'll see if they haven't already. There are uh, kirtans, any number of kirtans uh, to be seen and heard online. And one can listen to and one can also participate in these very joyful kind of singing, Hare Krishna mantra especially. It can be very, it can be fun, spiritual fun. Maybe for the end you can uh, chant just uh, one Hare Krishna Maha mantra, not sing, just say okay. it in perfect Sanskrit. All right. <laughs> to perfect <leave> us, Sanskrit. <laughs> to leave us with it. <laughs> like, our final message to our viewers. Okay. <clears throat> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Like Dr. That. Valpi, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to, to talk to you here. It was a real pleasure. My pleasure as well. Thank you. All the best.